Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, I did want to say, too, I think the last 10 years, so I've kind of focused a little bit on adaptive reuse. Uh, being in Detroit, a lot of properties we have there now are really going through the resurgence. And so uh, the last 10 years, I've kind of been able to focus in Michigan and, and taking some of these iconic historic buildings uh, and repurposing them for new uses. So today what I want to touch about is uh, the Knapp Center. Uh, and then these are the AIA, which I put in here, and we really, nobody else has done them, so I'll just skip through. Um, the Knapp Center is located in downtown uh, Lansing, Michigan. Uh, it is uh, about eight floors when you start counting the mezzanine and the basement floor and then the penthouse mechanical level uh, for about a total of 200,000 square feet total. Uh, construction cost was about 20 million. Uh, and it was designed as a downtown department store in the mid-1930s. Uh, the map kind of shows uh, item number one here is uh, where Naps is uh, located. Uh, it was actually designed by, uh, I'm going to pronounce it wrong, but Bold uh, Munson, uh, who also designed just up the river uh, the um, Ottawa Power Street Station, which was designed about 10 years earlier. Uh, and then in relationship, right number two is actually the uh, state capital uh, for the state of Michigan. So uh, the Nap Center is actually part of kind of the Washington Square Retail District. Um, kind of their main retail area, and so it was the primary downtown department store when everyone went downtown for uh, their retail shopping and stuff like that. Uh, it opened up in uh, 1938, uh, and in 1948 it went through a big expansion. Uh, the interesting thing is, while the exterior looks exactly the same, you can't tell the difference from the interior, it was two different types of structures. Uh, we're going to focus on kind of the 1937 structure because it's a little more interesting. Uh, but the 1948 structure really was kind of the same uh, panel system, but really adhered to a uh, clay tile backup system. Uh, so the two totally different uh, structural systems from the exterior. Uh, and we're going to focus kind of on the, on the 1937 portion of it. Uh, the project scope overall was a full, uh, complete gut renovation uh, in terms of exterior skin, interiors. Uh, as it was developed as a department store in the 1980s then, the department store moved out and the state of Michigan came in and, and infilled it all with uh, offices. So the interior, with the exception of a few iconic little areas, was pretty much already gut and rehabbed back in the 1980s. So there really wasn't much interior stuff left. Uh, the exterior really was just kind of maintained as, as, as was. Um, all the original material really was still on the building. Um, but it had been there for 75 years and a bit of, very little uh, maintenance had been done to it. Um, the, did, the project did receive uh, state and national uh, historic tax credits along with kind of the enhanced tax credits that the state of Michigan had at the, at the time. But today we're going to kind of focus on the exterior envelope of the building, uh, more specifically kind of two components. The, what we kind of call is the rain screen panel system, which was a mole Makata uh, panel system, uh, and then the glass block. Uh, which was used as the ribbons to provide light into the uh, retail area of the department store. Uh, and then a couple of things at the very end, some of the historic K panels, the steel windows, and some storefront uh, framing. But you can kind of see here the highlighted green or highlighted orange section is where the uh, Molokata panel screen screen system was. Uh, and then this is kind of where the uh, glass block, or not the glass block, but the uh, steel windows and the decorative K monuments were within kind of the glass block ribbons running each direction. So when we got onto the project site, this is really what it looked like. Uh, it's basically a corner lot. Uh, the back two sides are against the property line, so those were just basically brick construction, which actually was in good shape. But facing Washtenaw and Washington Street was the uh, Malmakata panel system, which at the time, uh, was kind of referred to as uh, one of the most iconic Art Deco buildings uh, in Michigan and actually in the Midwest. Um, this is some of the failures that we ran into it. Um, you can kind of see in the photo on the left-hand side here uh, panels that had, the metal panels that had slid in off the concrete, concrete panels that were completely missing. Uh, and then when you actually ripped off the interior wall, you could see that the concrete was eroding from the inside as well, leaving exposed uh, some of the uh, steel reinforcement. And then even in some areas over here, you can briefly see uh, the back side of the metal panels. Uh, from the outside, you can see all of the individual glass block that had been taped over, patched, or somehow trying to prevent water from getting inside, uh, as a lot of the glass block also had failed. So that was kind of the condition we saw the building when we got there. 
so first, let's kind of focus on the, on the rain screen system. We'll talk about kind of the technicalities of what failed uh, and how it was designed and why it failed, why we think it failed, and then the proposed uh, new systems uh, to replicate it. So this is the Mall Makata panel system uh, developed by the Mall Makata company. Uh, I don't think they're in business anymore. In all of our research, I couldn't find a phone number or anything like that. But essentially, it was this concrete panel that was hung or supported off a series of steel girts. And in reality, it really was kind of an early uh, curtain wall system. So we have this metal panel kind of right here in the middle. And on one side, it was finished with a porcelain enamel finish. And then the back side was raw, the raw material. What then wrapped that metal panel then was an aluminum trim band. And then the panel then was backed with uh, concrete. And the way they adhered the concrete to the panel was all of these individual copper clips that were welded to the back of the metal panel prior to the panel being finished. Uh, and then the, the, the aluminum trim then had kind of a, uh, I almost refer to almost like a drywall bead, kind of an edge to it then that the concrete could form into. So essentially you're kind of creating a concrete formwork for the concrete to, to, uh, to rest in. Then what it did was it actually sat on a series of uh, steel angles and then followed up with a bunch of steel clips that were bolted then to the back side of the concrete and basically this just hung off of the face of the building. Uh, the steel was attached to a separate concrete structure uh, that was traditional but this really was kind of the first rain screen system. Uh, looking at the historic drawings, uh, the interior finish was nothing but plaster. Uh, so as we started getting into the details, we realized that there really was no rain screen, there was or really no wind barrier, water barrier, uh, there was no insulation in this, in this historic system. Uh, and so we started to understand how it really was constructed and then how it had uh, developed over the years. When we got to the site, we realized that every single joint was caulked. So these panels were basically laid side by side, uh, butt end to butt end. And what they had done is that every single one of those aluminum trim panels they caulked that thing, which prevented water from getting in, but also prevented moisture from, from getting out. And then also in the 1970s, when, when the project went through some rehab, and I guess in the 80s too, when, they, when the state came in, they then furred out the walls and put in insulation because there was no insulation. And so to make it a little more comfortable, they did that. So our understanding really was that they kind of started trapping moisture in the building uh, and, and going from there. Um, the steel structure really was a bunch of vertical H sections, and then off of that, a whole bunch of steel horizontal beams for all the panels to sit in. Uh, my slide here, apparently the uh, highlighted areas have slid, but if you look over here, you can kind of see where the ribbon glass blocks uh, sat. They sat on the steel, and then in these areas here where we kind of have all the additional steel, that is where the concrete panels uh, then sat. Uh, when you got to these big monuments, actually there was a brick backing, and you can kind of see the coins Back there, that is where the panels actually rested and sat, and that's how they then attached the, the panels at those brick uh, coins to the, to the supports. So this is what the metal panels look like when we kind of started to take them off. You can start to see rusting points uh, on the backside, and while copper doesn't rust, what they used to adhere the copper to the metal panels did rust. So the panels that we started seeing falling from the, or the metal that we started seeing falling from the concrete, that's because these panels actually rusted enough that the weight of the, of the metal panels, because the metal panels themselves probably weighed close to 30 pounds, um, as they were quite large. Um, and so they would actually shear off the concrete. Um, you also start to see we had some issues with deterioration and rusting on, on the edges, rusting within the uh, porcelain enamel finish, and then you kind of start to see here the, the edge aluminum trim uh, as it was damage and cocked over and stuff like that. So we are trying to understand how we can now restore this material. So we had a plethora of different materials or a plethora of different conditions uh, of this material. And so one way obviously was can we take the concrete off the back of the metal panels, keep the metal panels that are in good condition, and then fabricate new metal panels to match. Well, it became an issue of how do we attach. Um, I couldn't weld anything new to the back of the metal panel because that would heat up the metal panel enough that would damage the porcelain enamel finish. So that option was out. The second option was then to mechanically fasten from the outside going back in. Problem with that was you would see then all these restored panels that would then have mechanical fasteners all the way around the perimeter to keep the metal, the metal anchored. So that really wasn't an option that we really want to go down either. The second option was to fabricate all brand new 
porcelain enamel panels. And there are companies out there that do porcelain enamel panels. You'll see them a lot on uh, retail development stores, that type of stuff. Porsche uses a lot of them in their high-end design stores. Um, so getting a metal panel today is, is easy. The problem was we couldn't get one with the aluminum trim edge. Um, companies don't do both of those. So one option was to either A, pre-drill the holes and try and get another company to match the holes and every panel was a bit different sizes and it became a kind of a coordination nightmare uh, to get one company to do one thing, ship it off to another company to do the other thing in hopes that everything aligned and then to put it on the building in hopes that everything abuts and, and looks good. So once we realized we couldn't kind of one-stop shop this thing and, and kind of guarantee to the uh, to the owner that at the end you're going to have a building that looks good, uh, we ended up going down the third route, which really was full full replacement. Um, so this is just kind of an image of them removing the uh, concrete backing from the back of the panels. Um, panels that were actually in good enough condition, we've actually donated them to an art uh, site, and so they're trying to come up with some form of art sculpture of some sort to try and use the, use the panels in some way or form. Um, so this was kind of the cross-section area of the uh, details. You can kind of see here, this is the historic side. This is kind of what we submitted into the, to the state for, for, for the tax credits. But you can see how the panel kind of integrated in with the, the steel angles. Uh, and then a couple of things I wanted to point out here is the, the dimensional here of the glass block sitting back from the inner of the panel. And then over here, I've kind of got the overall panel width. The panel uh, with the new system had to grow a little bit. So we were really concerned about making sure that these sight lines uh, relatively stayed in place because we could not adjust the glass block location because it sat on the steel. So our original design was really to remove all these intermediate uh, steel angles that wasn't necessary, come in with a new uh, structural steel wall uh, that sat on the existing concrete and then hang off a new rain screen system uh, off of that. That basically pushed the boundaries out about an inch and a half greater than, than what it was, but we kind of thought that was a, a good, day, good idea and, and acceptable. Um, this is kind of a cross-section of what the panel kind of looks like. Uh, you can kind of see it is a composite panel, uh, and then this is the clipping system then that goes on to uh, a dense glass or some form of sheathing then. And so basically this whole dimension here is two and a quarter inches. The company was then able to, and it's really hard to see in this angle, but put on a custom edge metal trim piece in order for us to have kind of that metal edge trim look. Uh, so each one of these pieces came pre-assembled and then slid onto on the site. Um, in order to make sure we got everyone's approvals and buy-ins and we understood how the process was going to go, we did actually a full-size mock-up uh, prior to actually fabricating all the panels. Uh, so you can kind of start to see basically how the details were going to go. You can kind of see the building wrap and then the exterior panel systems goes on top of that. Colors were not original, but we'll, we'll, we match them identically. Uh, and then you can actually kind of start to see kind of the new, the new details. Um, as construction started, we realized that the existing steel was actually in really good condition. We kind of thought, we, we, we didn't anticipate on using it because we anticipated it being in poor condition. But in the end, we were able to keep that existing steel framing and actually frame up to that. What that actually did, though, ironically, was it pushed our system forward a little bit more. Uh, so we ended up pushing it out a little bit further, which, which adjusted these sight lines. But again, in the end, we were talking a, an inch and a half difference overall. And, and from a street level, you really don't notice it. Um, so these are just some of the photos uh, of the new panel systems uh, being installed, uh, some of the corner conditions. Uh, again, you can kind of start to see that metal edge trim uh, as it wraps around uh, the historic K panel and how we deal with some of the flashings um, and stuff like that. The uh, historic K panels, just for everyone's information, is we kept those actually in place the entire time. That was too difficult for us to remove and put back in hopes that we would be able to save them. So. Uh, we actually kept those in place. We protected them with plywood uh, and, and worked around, around those. Um, the next component uh, was, the glass, was the glass block system. Um, and while we all knew that glass block uh, can be made today, we, there was a lot of changes that we wanted to, to have made in order for the building to, to function today. Um, the, the glass block originally was a prismatic glass block. So the idea back then was it's a department store. We want natural light to come in to, to highlight, but we want people to focus on the, the articles of goods. We don't want people to look outside. So the prismatic glass block did not allow people to view in and out. 
Um, but secondly, more importantly, today the prismatic glass block is, is not made. They've replaced it kind of with this new uh, cross rib uh, glass design. And so the option really was to kind of go back with this cross rib glass design, or in our opinion, we wanted to go back with a clear glass block. And being used as a department store, having the prismatic and not views was important. Being adaptively reused into an office space, being able to visually see inside and outside and have an idea of what was going on, weather, was really critical uh, to us and to the, to the owner. So we were trying to get the change from a prismatic glass block to this, this clear glass block. And in order to do so, they want you to show them that it's not going to change. So we did full-size mock-up again on the building. Um, and trying to illustrate the, the visual impacts from both the interior and the exterior uh, of what people would see between the clear and the cross red glass block. So the top image uh, you can see on this side here is the clear glass block followed with an existing panel in between followed by the uh, cross red glass block. From the interior down here you can clearly see there's a difference between the two. Uh, on the clear side you can see at least a hint of building shapes and sizes and forms from the exterior. And uh, thankfully, it was a sunny day in Michigan that day. But you can see skylight. You can see that it's blue. Uh, from the cross rib side, you really had no clue what it was outside. It could have been cloudy, raining, uh, snowing, probably. And, uh, and you really had no, no idea of no connection to the ex exterior by using that, the cross rib version. However, from the exterior, it looked exactly the same. And I'll point out here a little bit. You can kind of see a light fixture hanging here uh, in the clear glass block. And you can see that same light fixture hanging over here uh, in the cross. So from the exterior, you really didn't get this, the difference uh, as much. Now, you do have a difference between the, the existing prismatic and the clear. Uh, and we ended up working with the, the, the state to, to make sure that things were, and just for reference, the whole ceiling was being removed as well. So you weren't going to see this light fixture in the end. We were moving the ceiling up. but that's a much longer presentation, I had to cut it back. Um, so from the exterior, you wouldn't be able to really see anything that was kind of going on from the interior. Uh, so in the end, we were able to get the, um, the clear glass block. The other thing I want to point out, because it's going to lead into the next thing, is the, the whiteness around the, the glass block, the new glass block, uh, versus the existing glass block. You can see that even though 75 years later, uh, the mortar was probably extremely dirty, uh, when you looked at a gray mortar that was used around this glass block compared to the gray mortar used around the existing, it still looks very, very white. And so that was another issue that came out of this mock-up that we then had to, to begin to address. And so we started digging into that. Historic glass block was basically two pieces of glass fused together with a piece of lead. So right around the perimeter of the glass block would be then this lead joint that was heated up. The two pieces of glass were put together, and that's what created then glass block historically. Today, they don't use lead in construction. I'm not sure why, but they don't. So what they do today is they actually use glass as the fusing piece between the two separate pieces. So you really don't have this dark trim around the perimeter like you did with the historic. So when you saw it from the exterior, the glass block visually actually looks a little bit bigger than the, than the historic because of that non-lead being there. The other thing that they do is for adhesion of the mortar is they actually paint a white trim around the entire perimeter. And that then allows basically the light to reflect once it's inside that glass block, again, making it look uh, lighter and wider, and then actually makes the mortar uh, look whiter. So one day after work, uh, I was told I had to go to Home Depot, and I bought six cans of spray paint, all different ranges of, of gray. And the next day at the office, all we ended up doing was painting the perimeters of the glass block to try and get kind of a a dark trim around the outside. And so this was kind of a mock-up that we had done. And you can kind of start to see here around this very edge how this is kind of a darker darker gray. It's not quite a solid color, but it's, it's a bit darker than if it was white. And really what that is is the light reflecting off of this kind of gray painted glass block perimeter to kind of mimic that edge of what the lead joint was at one point in time. So you can look at this mock-up here, and you can see that the gray mortar, which was the same color we used actually out on the mock-up, really now starts to come off as a, as a gray mortar um, just by doing a couple of those little, little tweaks. Um, ironically enough, and I've never seen this done before, but we actually had the glass block, since there was so much glass block, uh, fabricated in panels uh, off-site and then shipped to, the off, or shipped to the site then like this, and then they were actually laid uh, in, the, in the joints, kind of in these panels, which I actually thought was kind of interesting. Um, 
And then this is kind of what it looks like from the exterior. So again, you really can start to see the, uh, the grayness around the perimeter uh, versus the white that we had on the, on the, other, on the other slides. Um, quickly, then I'm going to try and go through a little bit of the uh, historic panels. Um, as I said, on each of the pylons, there were the historic panels, K panels, as they refer to, for the NAP Center. Um, and so we kept those in place because we didn't really want to get into trying to take those off and put those back. Um, the uh, storefront, uh, similar to the Mayco uh, building that we saw earlier today, had the large storefront glass system. Um, it was an uninsulated single pane glass that if I pushed on it, the whole system would move in in about five inches. Um, so we ended up coming back and strengthening that on the back side of it so you didn't see it from the exterior, but keeping the same uh, pane size, but we were also able to go to an insulated glass too, uh, which, which would help from a standpoint of a comfort level right up against the windows. Um, so here's kind of a photo of the, the K panel kind of in place um, during the deconstruction of the rest of it. And then on the corner of the building was, was the NAP signage. And those panels were actually removed, sent down to Tennessee, restored, refabricated. Uh, one piece was refabricated as it was damaged. Uh, and then actually sent back in and reinstalled. So this next round of photographs, about 10 of them, is just kind of the sequence from beginning to end. Uh, so this is kind of what the building looked like when we took a hold of it. Uh, and then as you kind of start to see now, the, the panels are being taken off from the left to the right. Um, the steel is being exposed. Uh, more panels are coming off. And now you start to see that we're starting to put on the steel framing, the metal framing with the dense glass uh, wrapping it. And then, of course, then we're putting on the, uh, the Tyvex. We now have the thermal a moisture barrier uh, going around it. And now it's spring as we've got leaves on the trees. And now the metal panels are starting to get installed. There's actually a plastic film that they kept on the metal panels just to protect it from the, um, from the sun as long as they could, uh, just to protect them, or I guess more from construction. Um, and then we started kind of finishing it, and there's kind of the final, the final image. Um, and then we got a couple more. So here are some final images of kind of what it looks like. Um, and so in the end, basically, it's a brand new exterior skin from metal panels, insulation, uh, glass block. Uh, everything is brand new, but in the end, it, it almost looks identical. And, and an interesting thing about Lansing is every time we were there, you know, I had my hard hat on. And I remember coming to this store, and I remember seeing Santa, and I remember shopping with my grandmother. And, and there's a lot of nostalgia with this building. And uh, without being able to really redo the entire exterior skin, uh, this building would have... Uh, met the uh, demolition crew, I'm imagining. Um, and then just a couple interior, I didn't get into the interior, that's another whole half hour portion of the presentation. Um, but in order to help make it a, a class A office space, because it was really only uh, faced with windows on two sides, uh, the very little natural light actually got deep into the building. So the photograph on the left is a 40 foot by 60 foot atrium space that we cut into the middle of the building. Uh, for the office floors in order to bring natural light uh, in. So every office tenant will have access to natural light in some way or form. Uh, and the images on the right, uh, like I said, the interior was pretty much gutted in the 1980s for the state, um, but a few of the decorative elements, especially around the stairs, the railings, uh, the aluminum railings with the uh, gold cap uh, was still in existence, so we obviously were able to restore those uh, stairs uh, and uh, kind of create a new exciting, exciting entrance. So. That wraps up the NAP Center Redevelopment Project.